Hey there. What's up? What's up? Happy Friday to you. What's good in your world, my friend? I am so happy to be connected to you. Do you know why? Because I have been working like a crazy woman this week. It has been intense, for real, for real. Why? Mm, because I have six books that I'm publishing, including my own, in the next mm, six weeks or eight weeks. And I'm also going to London next week for a major, major mastermind. So it's been a little bit crazy trying to juggle everything. What's up, Casey Sun, Salut. Jeanette and Sarah Kate, lovely to see you guys on a Friday. What is good in your world? What are you currently dealing with in, in this little life of yours? Are you happy? Is life good? What's up? Thank you, Faida. Happy Friday to you. I am really curious to know how many of you have had an experience with an inner bully like an inner meanie, you know, that little voice in your head that kind of like makes you feel like a big fat loser, although that's probably not a L for you, is it? Yeah. <laughs> loser. There were a couple of moments where that's literally how I felt. I felt like a complete and utter loser. And I knew that I had to like check myself because as I've said to you guys many times before, I realize that I am a model for my daughter. And because my daughter listens to everything that I say and watches everything that I do, I just didn't want her to like end up being like self-critical. So I like had to check myself because I noticed that I was like calling myself names in my head. Does anybody else ever do that or am I the only one? You know what I'm saying? What's up, Shimoni? Uh, no, Sherman. I was thinking of Shimoni. We have to give a shout out to Shimoni. <clears throat> Send her some healing love. So today is gonna be like the major self-healing, <laughs> group healing moment, okay? Like, for real, for real. Why? Because, <clears throat> uh, because that's just what we need we need to really tap into the ability to heal ourselves and get past our nonsense. Because what I've found is it's really, really easy for us to stay in negativity land and it's really, really hard to give ourselves a break and be more gentle with ourselves. Does anybody else have that problem or is it only me? <laughs> I know it's not only me. Because I've been talking to some people, too, who were like, wait, what? You feel that way, too? I thought I was the only one. And I'm like, no, you're not the only one. Unfortunately, we all got a little bit of that. And so I want to talk about this idea of the self-judgment that we live with on an almost daily basis. This internal state of affairs where we feel like, it's okay to beat ourselves up. And the reason it's so bad is because it leads to and perpetuates low moods and depression. And I was just looking at the, the statistics that the United Nations put out. And did you know that more close to 800,000 people per year commit suicide? Like, I want you to get a, a sense for how big that number is because it's actually more than natural disasters and the deaths that come from uh, armed combat combined. And those are preventable deaths in most cases, right? So, okay, we can't prevent a natural disaster and okay, the deaths from armed conflict, that's a whole nother show. But if you, if, have you really ever thought about that? For anyone who's ever had those thoughts of suicide, um, then you know how dark a place that is. And I was talking with a couple of people over the last week. Um, some of you have seen, hopefully you, you heard the interview I did with the lovely Taz Thornton. We have um, 
uh, we just did an interview about her latest book, Unleash Your Awesome. And, you know, she describes in very vivid detail, she is an incredible storyteller, the kinds of thoughts that went through her mind and the feeling of the world would be better off without me. And I don't think most people who haven't dealt with depression, most people are not really aware of how pervasive these thoughts are. And I think that if we really kind of take a step back and, and look at where does self-criticism even begin? Like it doesn't start just all of a sudden one day because you made a mistake, then you're a bully to yourself. Like self-criticism starts in childhood. And that's why I, I recognized this week, I was like, oh, I gotta check myself. <laughs> Because if I'm showing my daughter that it's okay to beat up on yourself mentally and walk around calling yourself a loser and that you're lame, then she's going to think that that's okay too. And as we were talking about something, it was like, wow, we have really high standards. Okay, I have replaced perfectionism with just having a high standard of excellence. But even that, if I fail to like check myself, I can let myself falling from that high standard cause me to go into negativity land. And when you, when you really think about where it all begins, it begins in childhood. We hear somebody either tease us on the playground or a family member makes fun of us or a parent or an authority figure scolds us for some sort of behavior that we engage in whether that's talking too loud or smacking your brother across the head, you know, for good or for bad, we do something as children. We get scolded or teased, and then we start questioning our own motives and actions and behaviors. And eventually, that external judge, if you will, becomes an internal judge. And in my case, I recognize somewhere in my like early 30s, I know you thought I was just 31, right? But in my early 30s, I recognized that I had like the Supreme Court judges, you know? I had these people in my head sitting around a round table, judging my every move, my thoughts, my actions, my behaviors, and even my motives. And I would hear voices no, I'm not schizophrenic. Don't be trying to send me off to the loony bin. But I would hear these voices say, that's not good enough. Or, oh, what is this person going to think? Or, oh, you did that wrong. And all of this self-criticism was just rolling around in my head. And I was feeling like, well, dang, I'm just, I'm a loser. If I didn't hit that high standard, I felt like a complete failure. Has anybody else ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like if you didn't get everything absolutely perfect that you were somehow defective or worthless? Because that's what happens in our childhood. We get teased or scolded. We do something wrong. We, we may not even hear anything. Because in my house, shoot, Dr. P, my mother, all she had to do was look at you. For real. I mean, it was just a look and that was it she could just look and I knew you know and I've talked to some of my clients like that they just had a look from a father or a mother and it was like they would shrink inside and that's when we as children before we have our own super duper conscious awakening to recognize that okay their judgment doesn't mean I'm bad and even if I did do something bad, that behavior doesn't make me a bad or worthless person. But we don't know that as children. We just think, oh my God, I've made mommy mad or dad mad. Oh my God, I got caught stealing or cheating or whatever that thing is. And it starts to impinge upon our self-worth. And so those voices who used to be external, those judges, those people whose approval we used to seek, they get internalized and they become a part of our inner world. And 
So Zazie, you're saying you had an interesting dream about how to use those inner voices constructively. Nice, well, we're gonna get into that. I wanna compare notes with you. Because one of the other beautiful authors from our upcoming book, The Time to Rise, um, Gita Vinter was talking about the voices in her head. And lucky Gita has had very positive voices in her head for most of her life. Um, and she has been able to use them constructively. So I'm curious to hear from you, Zazie, um, what your tricks are, and, and I'll share with you my tips. So what is up, Yvette? Welcome. And so Casey Sun says, you discovered in a healing session that you put in a system of survival because you punished yourself and you know this voice so well. And that is it. This is the thing that really got me hyped up when I started to do research. <laughs> you knew you weren't gonna get away from one week without me giving you my research, right? Well, it's interesting because when I was writing my last book, The Orgasm Prescription for Women, which is packed with neuroscience, there was this really interesting thing that I discovered. And there were these researchers that found that the more self-criticism we engage in, um, you can trace it back to childhood. And for people who may have experienced some sort of abuse or neglect or trauma, or they were teased or just bullied, or they felt you know, they didn't get enough attention because they were like one of many children. Many times the experience in our childhood puts us into this mode of survival, just like what you're saying, Casey. And it was like in survival mode, we end up focusing all of our mental energy and attention to make sure that we're not gonna piss somebody off or break some rule or misbehave. And what researchers have found is when you stay in that survival mode where you're constantly looking out for threats, the tiny brain of ours in childhood doesn't develop the self-soothing mechanism. Like we have an inherent ability in our brain to calm ourselves down, to regulate our nervousness and tension, and to actually be kind to ourselves. Like we're wired for it. But if in your early childhood, you overwhelmed the system and kept it focused in the threat detection system, being hyper vigilant, worried about your survival, because as a kid, that's what it feels like five years old on the playground, you worried about somebody gonna grab your woolly jumper or steal your lunch money. If you're constantly in that threat detection and survival mode, they, they have found that the part of the brain that helps us create self-compassion doesn't develop as much, which means we end up always being in threat detection mode. So that's where this like inner bully, this little snotty mean girl in my head came from. For me, I wasn't teased on the playground, except for being a little bit of a nerd, um, but it was more this, you know, wanting to make sure I was getting the approval of my dad and make sure I wasn't gonna do anything wrong over here or over there. And that's what leads us to internalize and create a whole system in our head. For me, it was I, literally in my 30s, I called them the Supreme Court judges. You know, in America, we have all these Supreme Court justices that rule in on cases. Well, they were ruling in on my life. And they would tell me when I was screwing up, messing up, I wasn't good enough, I never felt good enough. And even when I did an incredible job, I never felt good enough. And I don't know if you know how that feels, but over time, that sense of, I'm a loser, I'm worthless, I can't do anything right. The depression got deeper and deeper and darker. And I didn't want even life to go on because I got to that point where everything I did to compensate, all the compensation behavior, which for me was trying to make sure I was achieving more and doing more and being perfect, all that perfectionism, that wears, honey, that wears a sister out. Where's anybody out? <laughs> yes, Yvette, the British bird is back. So I don't know if anyone else has ever had that experience where you finally recognize that the voices in your head, they got to go or, you know, somebody's got to go. Salut, Romeo. 
Bienvenue. So, Shimoni, I was just mentioning you a moment ago. Glad to have you here. This episode, not that this has anything to do with Shimoni, but today we are going to focus on, thanks to a conversation with you, Romeo, and also some influence from Shimoni, I really felt that the conversation I have with my daughter this week about me falling into that trap of feeling judgmental, hey Nicola, I realized that I had to nip it in the bud because basically I don't want to break my child. <laughs> no, I just knew that if I model for her my neurotic behavior of the past, she's going to think that that's okay. And she was already starting to say, oh, did I do a good enough job over here? And what about this? And I was like, whoa, stop. Where's all this self-judgment coming from? So I wanted to talk in English <laughs> because I did this interview with Romeo in French and it was not my greatest. I'm not, I'm not beating up on myself. I'm just saying I'm so much more expressive in English. You know what I'm saying? But it's this concept that we can overcome this programming and kick the inner meanie, that critic, that judge, that bully out of your brain. And most importantly, if you've been living with self-critical thoughts and attitudes and behaviors such that they've caused you to end up in depression or in the words of Dr. Janet Anthony, you've chameleonized. Like how many of us have <clears throat> molded and shaped and folded ourselves to try to change something about ourselves so that we wouldn't be judged, we wouldn't be criticized, that we could still get that validation and approval. And as you know, the more you try to fit into someone else's program, the less of your authentic self you are being. Hello, Helen Ribello, leader of the Peaceful Rebellion. Helen, this is not a peaceful day for me, although we're, at the end I'll, I'll send out the peace, but I had to really get, <laughs> I had to get active and kick out some judges out of my head because, you know, it's almost insidious if you've had these voices in your head for a while. If you've been used to judging yourself and calling yourself names for a while, it takes like practice to get rid of it. And, and that's what I was talking to the coach intuitif, Romeo Curnal. So I did this interview in French about self-compassion and I think it's so critical because it's so hard for people to be compassionate to themselves. And for me, I know that it, it ended up in depression but as I treated people with all kinds of health diseases and challenges and maladies, I also discovered that when you are really sick for a long period of time, you also have a certain number of voices that come in that are not always bright and cheery. They're not saying, oh, honey, this is temporary. You're going to be able to pick yourself up. Don't worry. Like... <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. That doesn't happen if you've had a chronic illness. But what we need the most is not just a hug from someone else, but we need that mental compassionate hug from ourselves. When we are really feeling at our worst, we have to activate that part of the brain which calms down the stress response and lifts up our immune system so that we can fight back from whatever that disease or that challenge is. And at the heart of resilience and all the resilience research, like resilience is this ability to bounce back after the storms of life, you know, subside. Like resilience is, is actually a muscle. It's, or a collection of muscles that can be strengthened. And there are certain practices that help us get better at bouncing back. And it's the same thing with self-compassion. The more compassionate we are, the more we practice it, we actually build up our compassion muscles. And when I said earlier that each of us actually is wired to have a part of our brain that helps us soothe and calm down, it's part of this compassion circuitry. You know, so we got these little brain circuits up in there and the more we engage those brain circuits, the more they become the most active 
and dominant part of our neurochemistry. It doesn't happen overnight. It does take practice and it takes ongoing, um, yeah, practice. So one of the things that I um, have shared with the world is the 21 day compassion meditation challenge. And if you're dealing with anything, stress, loss, fatigue, illness, or just the same kind of depression that I dealt with, then I would invite you to do this 21 day challenge with us. It's totally free. Each day you get an inspiring message, an affirmation, a guided compassion meditation, and some beautiful images, because you know, we have to do it in multiple modalities. And, and Casey, yes, you're right, it's not easy to do, and that's why we have to practice it. And if we can practice it on a daily basis, at least for 21 days or more, you will find a shift. And I think the, the biggest thing that a lot of people say is, oh, I can't give myself a break. If I give myself a break, then I won't keep striving to be better, or I'll get too soft. And that is so, so, so not true. All of the research shows that by being kind and compassionate to yourself, you don't get lazy and you don't get, you know, wishy-washy. You actually build up your resources for being stronger and coming out even bigger, badder, and bolder. And there's an author, um, his name is Ajahn Brahm, and he's um, a Buddhist monk who wrote a book called Don't Worry, Be Grumpy. And one of the things that he said is, you know, you don't get big headed for practicing self-compassion or giving yourself praise. You become big hearted. <clears throat> and that's something that we all really need. We need to develop even bigger hearts of compassion for ourselves and for everyone else. What's up, Shelly? What's up, Veronica, Sam? So I want you to do a couple of things. One is join the Compassion Meditation Challenge so that each day when you listen to this audio or you can read it and do it you know, on your own, you're just gonna recite four phrases, four simple phrases, and try to literally create the feeling and the experience of compassion. So does anybody have a good definition of the word compassion? Type away, my friends. Type away. How would you define compassion? And the reason I want you to really think about the definition is because we don't often take the time to be mindful. You know, I mean, I know that the mindfulness movement is like a big deal these days, <laughs> but we're not really mindful of our own human tendencies. We're not even mindful of of where we have the opportunity to change. And so by just recognizing that all of us on the planet, just by the mere fact that we're human, we become self-conscious. It's very few people, unless they grow up in some sort of an ashram or whatever, most little humans eventually realize, oh, I am separate from mommy, okay? There's this me-ness, amigo as I call it, and as we develop that self, and depending on what happens in our environment, we start to become self-judgmental -judge and self-critical uh, and self-conscious. And because all of us on the planet seek connection, because we're wired for it, like human beings, in order to survive for all the millennia we have survived, we had to be connected. We had to travel in packs. We are pack animals. We're tribe creatures. <laughs> Without a tribe, our ancestors would have been eaten by tigers and bears or they would have starved. And so if you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, we are wired to connect and to be a part of community. And so it's natural for us to seek approval and seek acceptance and seek validation because the consequence of not getting that meant that we, we might end up dead. So when you guys define compassion, Shimoni says, it's feeling a strong sense of warmth and kindness for ourselves or for someone else. Love it, Shimoni. 
Zazi says, compassion is to be connected at the heart and an understanding and recognition of what the other person might be going through. So that, I would actually say, Zazi, is the definition of empathy. Empathy is to understand or to feel that we understand what someone else is going through, whereas the compassion, the difference between empathy and compassion is, compassion is the desire or the feeling that we have towards another person or ourselves. It's a wish that we wish that they would not suffer. Compassion is the desire for another being to not suffer. So empathy is, oh, I feel for you. Wow, I can feel what that would be like if you woke up every single day just wishing you could hide under the duvet because of your depression. That's empathy, I know what that feels like. Sympathy is when we start to feel sorry for someone else, like, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, poor you. So we have empathy, sympathy, and compassion. Compassion is more of an action, it's, it's getting closer to action in that we wish that that other person didn't have to suffer. And when we feel that for ourselves, it's recognizing, wow, in this tender moment, oh, I pray that you get through this without suffering. And Helen says, for you, it's about accepting ourselves and others and letting go of judgments as much as we can. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the leading researchers today um, talks about this idea of shared humanity. And it's accepting that I am human. It, and this is what I'm, I was writing about in my book this week. It's like when you recognize that we all seek approval and validation because we're wired to connect, then you can give yourself a break. And you can also give other people a break. And just that awareness is kind of your first step to saying, oh, wow, here I go into that approval seeking. Am I chameleonizing, trying to fit in, trying to get their approval? Because the, the, the fear or the, the risk is the more that you mold yourself to fit someone else's paradigm or version of reality, the more of yourself you, you risk losing. Because when you're not being your full expressed self, if you're putting up this false self, the real you is kind of being left in the background and for some people, they end up denying or judging parts of their personality and really putting it, not even in the background, it gets squashed into what you know, psychologists call the shadow. You know, the Swiss psychologist Carl Jung called it the shadow. And it's that part of us that we feel like we don't want anyone else to know about. And so we hide it. We feel ashamed when we express parts of that, that aspect of ourselves. Shamika says, it's been a lifelong journey of work through the voices. Um, and yes, thanks for what I said about childhood survival mode. You spent most of it not trying to not make a mistake which resulted in perfectionism. I know what that's like. And it's taken a while for me to get past that, that perfectionism and, and just finally giving myself a break and realizing, wow, Andrea, can, rather than looking at what you didn't achieve, can we switch and like look at what you did achieve? Can you acknowledge that you did get you know, amazing work done or whatever, or that you maintained your cool. This is the thing I've been praising myself for lately. Not getting big headed, I'm getting big hearted. I was like, wow, I'm really managing all of this without snapping at anybody. Because a few years ago, if I got under pressure, I would eventually snap. I would go off on somebody. It wasn't pretty, I'm not proud of it. Whew. And that would start a whole nother negative cycle of like self-judgment. Because if I snapped at someone, definitely if I ever snapped at my daughter, then I would just go into, oh my God, I'm a bad mother. Oh, I'm the... <sighs> just even thinking about it makes me want to vomit. Shelly says, um, compassion for you is connectedness and having the ability and willingness to empathize with others. Yes. So it gets back to this idea that we want a person to not suffer. This feeling that we can say to ourselves and to another, may you 
be free from suffering. So I was sharing with um, uh, Romeo uh, on this interview this week that if we look back thousands of years <laughs> to the Buddhist tradition that where they practice something called metta, which comes from the Pali canon, you know, for those of you Pali scholars. Anyway, this, the, metta is this Pali word for um, compassion. It's this kindness, the kindness that a mother feels toward her child where she desires that her child not suffer. So it's different from pity. It's different from empathy. Um, it's this desire that they not suffer. Now, when you put your compassion into action, that's a whole other thing. Now, and that can be rescuing. Been there, done that too. Where you feel like, oh my God, the compassion drives me so much that I want to like dive in and try to save people. Lord have mercy. And that's a whole other thing. Um, so Dr. Janet, I mentioned you earlier about chameleonizing. She says, compassion helps one move past chameleonizing and it causes one to suffer in the shadow of someone else. Yes. So you get it, y'all. Um, so yeah, and Henrietta, Henriette, Henrietta, whatever, you tell me how to pronounce your name, darling. Compassion is an energy you cannot reject. Well, I hope that people will not reject it because the more we can engage in this compassion for ourselves, where you can actually say to yourself, wow, you know, may I get through this without suffering. May I be truly happy and at ease. May I be peaceful. May I be safe. Um, may I be truly well in body, mind, and heart. The more that we are able to tap into the waves and the energy of compassion, the more we can actually give ourselves a break. And then that's going to give you the ability to turn on another part of your personality. Now, I took a risk in my last book because I wanted to have all this compassion stuff. So there's an entire chapter on mindfulness and meditation and compassionate mind training and healing the inner child and going back and like rescuing your inner child and bringing it to the present and all of that. There's a whole lot of positivity in my work. And the one thing that I took a risk at <laughs> was sharing one other voice. So Zazie, you mentioned this before, that you found a way to take some of the voices in your head and make them constructive. And um, I found another character. I don't know that compassion is the word I would use to describe her. In the book, I call her the F-U girl. And F, yeah, you can, you can spell that one out. She, yeah, she has a different standard. Um, I took a chance in describing her because it does seem like, wait, what? You, Andrea, you're supposed to be all full of positivity and compassion and love. But sometimes having an inner bully who is not bullying you, but is instead causing you to speak up for yourself so that other people don't bully you and cross over boundaries. Because all of us rescuer types. <laughs> that go against what you're talking about, Margarita. Self-compassion is having compassion for others and the self, I would say, without having the urge to change things. Well, for some of us, we would go into, you know, I want to fix everything, I want to fix everyone, I want to make... <sighs> People pleasers. So my inner F.U. girl, she will occasionally throw some F-bombs because I'm just saying, there is no more versatile word in the human language than the F-bomb. I know, not popular. Mm -hmm. And uh, Janet, Dr. P, my mother, if she ever heard me drop an F-bomb, she would, she would, in her very British tone, oh, I raised you better than that. Don't you have a more colorful vocabulary than to say that? But you know what, for real, if y'all haven't seen this little video with Osho, you know, Osho, what was his name, Sri Bhagnish, you know, this, anyway, spiritual guy, he did a very brilliant, like, five-minute explanation about the word F-U-C-K. Brilliant. But here you go. All right, so my F-U girl, here's what she said. Yes, 
you, you got it, Zazie. That, ugh, that one, I just shared that with someone recently because Osho, he put it so brilliantly. Okay, anyway, so here we go. So the FU girl, she has these standards and they all start with F. <laughs> one of them was, and this is really about values and boundaries. She would say, if we were in a situation where I was starting to feel like I wasn't confident to be my real self or to express myself or to say no, or I was starting to <clears throat> get into that mealy mouth, checking myself, am I good enough or whatever. You know that feeling where you start to shrink and you start to wonder if you're good enough or you know that feeling, right? If I felt that come on, sometimes she would be like, girl, no, you didn't. And she would say, look, go through the five F's. It's not pretty, but here it is. Number one, are you feeding me? That's the first F. Because if you ain't putting food on my table, get the F out my face. I know, not pretty. The second F, well, I won't say it in polite company, but um, anyway, she would ask, you know, are you, are you the one putting it down? Well, if you're not my, you know, bed rocking lover, pff, get the F out of my face. Are you the father of my children? Oddly enough, my FU girl has respect for, for fathers. So she was like, look, if all these people out there, if you're not the one feeding me, putting it down in a bedroom or on the kitchen table, or you're not the father of my children because she has respect for the father, then get the F out of my face. Number four, are you furthering my cause? Like, are you here over here helping my charity or helping my business, helping me to you know, live my life to the fullest? Get the F out my face. And number five, are you a whole lot of fun? You know how there's certain people that you will tolerate because they're just so much fun. You just feel good with them. You know, these were her standards. So anytime I was feeling that sense of shrieking, my super ego girl is on fire. This girl is on fire. That's right. She was like, look, if you are not, then get the F out my face. Now, I know that's not pretty, but if there is this sense that you need to be a champion for yourself, you might have to unleash your inner FU person. I'm just throwing it out there. So I want to end with this. The, the bottom line is that we need to be able to speak to ourselves in kind and loving tones. Practicing self-compassion is one of the things that's going to help you rewire your brain so that you can pull yourself up out of depression, anxiety, sickness. Like, do you know how many studies have been done that literally have compared meditation, specifically this compassion meditation, versus drugs, as in antidepressants? And did you know that practicing meditation was the same or better than antidepressants? It was also the same or better than placebos. So why not do something that actually impacts your brain, makes you a better person, makes you a better parent, so that you can actually live longer? Because the reality is when we let our brain stay in that threat detection mode, which is what happens when your inner bully is always looking out for every little opportunity to either attack or to, you know, defend because you're so afraid. Leaving yourself in that threat detection stress response mode, it wrecks your health. Insomnia, impotence, all kinds of drama, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and yes, even Alzheimer's. All of those are linked to the stress response. And so by practicing compassion, we can actually raise our body's energy. And yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. So I put together this 21 day challenge for you. It's got all this lovely music. You get to chill out and relax. It's a few minutes. And if you like my voice, my kind voice, not the F you girl's voice. If you like my voice, then you can you know, put it in your little earphones and listen to and practice the compassion meditation every single day. Totally free. I don't know if Sarah Kate's still here, so I might have to pop over here and put it into the chat. I will tell you where you can get it. Um, www.attunement.com.
meditation, meditation.com forward slash compassion. Totally free. Um, and you can get the emails delivered to you every day. Listen along and check and see what happens for you. I got the most beautiful messages from a couple of people who've been trying this around the world. And one of them I've mentioned before, the creator of this beautiful thing, Gega, who created the Smiler. You know, she, um, she has been doing it, the, the Compassion Meditation Challenge with me for a couple of years. And she was talking about, you know, the challenge of being a nurse, working in a hospital, going through drama. And just by tapping into that wave of compassion, I describe it as like a radio station. Like, remember that these waves of love and positivity are around us all ways, just like the waves of a radio station or a TV station. So we are human antennas. And if you can tune in to compassion, and sometimes if you can't say it for yourself, then you can imagine that you have a compassionate figure. Imagine that there is the Dalai Lama or um, your grandmother who passed on or Jesus or a saint or an angel or whatever, some compassionate being that is just sending you waves of positivity. And imagine, instead of you saying it to yourself, imagine reciting these four phrases. <sighs> May I be happy if you can't say it to yourself, then you imagine that this compassionate being is just there kind of sending you a warm hug, like saying, you know, may you be happy. May you be truly well in body, mind, and heart. May you live with ease and grace. May you be peaceful and truly happy. And just feel what it would feel like if you heard that if you were tuned into the radio station WLUV and those waves of compassion were being sent out to you, imagine how that would feel and allow yourself to actually bask in that feeling. So I know that some of you are also going through some challenges. You've shared that with me. I've shared with you mine. And so I'd like for us to collectively just, can we beam some love and positivity out to this tribe? To anyone who needs this, boost of love and compassion to give yourself a break to give yourself that little lift for all the stress for all the drama and the trauma yeah I see the little hearts Shimoni yes I'm sending you lots of love and compassion may you be truly well truly well in body mind and heart may you be peaceful and at ease Yes, Shelly, you're welcome. So if we could each just beam out the same love that, and compassion that we could all be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Like what's the number one cause of suffering? Lack of awareness. It's a lack of awareness as to why we suffer. So if you really go back to the Buddhist version of it, the words are, may you be free from suffering and the causes of suffering which in some cases doesn't mean that your health challenge or your financial challenge or your relationship challenge is going to change right then and there but your cause of suffering is you thinking that you are a little tiny human that you're frail that you're weak and that's not true <laughs> thank you for the hearts Janet pew, 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 pew. You f we forget who we are I know Janet, she's writing a story about it, recognizing who she really is. That is what sets you free. When you know who you really are, instead of believing the lies about who you thought you were or who you tried to be and just never could succeed. In the words of Helen Ribello, nobody can do you like you can do you. So quit trying to be somebody else, you know? Anyway, so my friends, may you be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May you know true happiness and the causes of happiness. May you live well in body, mind, and heart. And may you be truly, truly peaceful. That is, peace 
full. I love y'all. I'm sending you much love. I want you to know I missed you this week. I don't know if you missed me. <laughs> but I had to practice a lot of this self-compassion for myself as I was getting um, my book done. And again, for anybody out there, you guys want to send some love to Dr. Janet Anthony. And a few of you too have also been asking me for my, my work. Like, okay, we saw the TED Talk. We know we got to love ourselves. How do we do it? The book is finally done-ish. Om Shanti. It is pretty much done. I've sent it over to the, to the editor. I mean, don't tell her I said it's pretty much done. It's done. She has it. I will make little tweaks, of course, naturally. I do mention the beautiful work of uh, Yvette Taylor and her energy alignment method. So you'll see some, some new interviews with Helen Rebello, the author of The Magical Unfolding, forthcoming, and Yvette Taylor and Taz Thornton and even Malcolm Out Loud. <laughs> if any of you have listened to my radio show on America Out Loud, I interviewed him, which he doesn't do interviews, by the way. But we're expanding the network and looking for new talent. And I wanted my tribe to understand who this man is and how he got me to join the network. So I have an interview with him coming out. So I just really am committed to sharing the wisdom from a variety of traditions, from a variety of voices and people, so that you can share and shine the light and find other ways to heal and be more kick-ass. So that's it, my friends. I wish you all a fabulous, fabulous weekend, and I will see you again next week. Next week is going to be a little limited as well. I'll probably only be live once, um, unless I do little shorter ones, because I'm going to London for a mastermind and then doing the Roots of Purpose retreat here in the south of France. I know you're joining us. Dr. Janet, you're flying over from the U.S., so it's going to be a fabulous weekend here in the French Riviera next week. Have a fabulous, fabulous weekend. Be kind to yourselves. Love yourselves. Appreciate, you know, how fabulous you really, really are. And join us for the 21-Day Compassion Meditation Challenge. All right? Bye. No, bye for real this time. Bye.